All right, ladies and gentlemen, really quick, I just want to tell you about one of our fantastic sponsors, and that is Soldier Girl Coffee Company. So if you are watching the video, you can definitely check out the screen share here. I am on our website, and you can go to affiliates, or this will be changing to sponsors soon, and click on Soldier Girl Coffee. As it says on the website, Soldier Girl Coffee is a veteran-owned company. Uh, they definitely provide the absolute best coffee I've ever had. Uh, it definitely has the pick-me-up that I need in the morning. If we check out her website, of course, down in the right-hand corner, you can definitely chat with her. You can get exclusive discounts. Discounts she offers to our listeners uh, just by putting your email address in the box on the website. Uh, as you can see right here, she has French vanilla cream, 100% Colombian snickerdoodle Hawaiian hazelnut, and she offers regular as well as CBD-infused coffee. So be sure to go and check out her website. Of course, you can get there by going to our website at businessandbrewshow.com slash soldier-girl-coffee, or you can just click the link in the show notes and it'll take you right here. You click on view products and it takes you over to shop around. She even has a little bit of merch. I know when I ordered uh, my bag of Colombian roast, uh, I really, really enjoy Colombian roast and she has the best Colombian roast that I have ever had. Uh, and of course is a veteran owned business, but I got a sticker as well as a thank you note. Uh, so I really enjoy that so now i have my very own soldier girl coffee mug that i can drink my soldier girl coffee out of so once again right now exclusive discounts just for our listeners everybody drinks coffee whether you're a veteran or a business owner you're going to need it you're going to need it for your staff you're going to need it for your break room you're going to need it for your house so go ahead right now click the link in the description in the show notes uh, right here right now and go get some soldier girl coffee today ladies and gentlemen i am super excited and absolutely have to tell you about a phenomenal way to build your website and keep it up to date my name is Ryan Smeltz, host of the Business and Brew Show and co-host of Veteran Talk Show. And if you are watching this, I want you to pay close attention to my screen share. This is the website of the Business and Brew Show. And the way I am talking about keeping your website, building it, getting it up to date, and having it managed is by Online Rob. So Rob is absolutely phenomenal. And what I absolutely love about this is he was able to customize the website exactly how I asked him. So as you can see, the homepage has a ton of different pictures from different episodes. Of course, here on the episodes page, you're able to listen on your favorite platform, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Public, iHeartRadio, uh, or CastBox. Uh, you can connect with us, of course, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, listen to uh, the five most recent episodes right here on the website. And of course, you can find our sponsors such as Soldier Girl Coffee and of course, Online Rob. So the best thing about this is, as you can see on my screen, if you're watching, uh, Online Rob is a veteran-owned small business. He will design, build, and manage the entire website for you. That comes with free unlimited updates, a domain name, your business email, and a logo if you need it. All included for our listeners is only $2.99 per year. As it says right on the screen, there are absolutely no contracts and no hidden fees. I handed this to him. He had it back within a very short amount of time. And anytime I need an update or have a question, he is there to help out. So I strongly encourage you, once again, for our listeners, you can go to businessandbrewshow.com slash online dash Rob, or you can click on the link in the show notes. Uh, if you are not watching the video version, the link is definitely in the show notes. Be sure to check out our website. I'm super happy with his work. I'm really excited that I no longer have to figure out where to get an SSL, how to install it. I don't have to install the pixel for my Facebook ads. I don't have to manage any of the analytical tools such as Google Analytics, and I don't have to figure out how to connect the domain or set up a business email. He handles all of that for me for the low price of $2.99 per year. So once again, for our listeners, Online Rob offering this exclusive deal, be sure to go check it out. Make sure when you fill out the form, you put that you heard about him from us in the How Did You Hear About Us box. Uh, business and Brews show or Veterans Hall show, of course, you can always use my name, Ryan Smeltz. And no longer as a business owner will you have to build and manage your own website. Have online Rob do it for you. Take advantage of this exclusive deal, only $2.99 per year. Best of all, he can handle everything from, of course, a podcast to an e-commerce site. Uh, no matter what kind of business you run, Online Rob can handle it for you. So go right now, click on the link, fill out the form, take advantage of this exclusive offer, and be sure to put the show name in his How Did You Hear About Us box. Now, let's get back to the show. Welcome to the Business and Brews podcast, where our mission is to highlight local businesses and shed light on different industries. I'm, uh, I'm really trying to get to the point where I can just send up, do quick edits on it myself, because yeah. I know what'll happen. It's once I figure it out, it's not that difficult. Yeah. It's just a little bit of time. 
uh, and and figuring out. But so one two two things I started doing, which are basically the same thing, is uh, sub sequences and and presets. So basically, in layman's terms, templates. Mm -hmm. um, so I set them up, uh, save them, uh, both in Premiere and Audition or whatever program I okay. use. Uh, and so when I take this footage and I put it in there, uh, I can do my bulk edits from a higher level, um, but I don't, I don't do a lot. Hmm. Um, I don't edit out clutch words, cuss words. Um, I don't do any cuts unless we were to have something major, like somebody walked in or, yeah. you know, had to take a break or something. But um, then, of course, I have my sub sequence for the intro and the credits. Then I can click into that and, like, change the words and stuff. So. What I started doing, and this, you know, you being where you are may not be a good fit, but Justin and uh, another guy, Ricky Johnson, um, good dude, Marine veteran, uh, does motivational speaking for addiction and recovery. Hmm. Um, so I'm like, look, it's going on my channels, but you create the content, you'll get the exposure. It can be your show. Mm -hmm. I'll do all the editing, post-production, distribution. Yeah. You get a thousand views per episode, then we'll cut you off and make your own mm -hmm. channel from there. So, um, but yeah, if, I mean, if you get started doing the stuff yourself and you got a question, send it to me. Awesome. Uh, I have absolutely no interest in editing other people's stuff mm -hmm. with the exception of my little 10 minute shows I'm getting from those sure. guys. Um, I want to get this to a point where the revenue allows me to hire someone else. To do yeah, it. there you go. I want to sit around and talk. There you go. Hey, that's, that's the <laughs> ideal scenario, you know? Yeah. Uh, and especially if it's helping people, you know, being a positive to people as well. No. But, uh, <laughs> there, but, uh, um, so did you have anything in mind, uh, as far as talking today specifically, or you just, uh, so, so normally, <clears throat> um, what, what I do is a little intro, have you introduce yourself and what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, probably more about you than I do your business. Okay. Um, but uh, we kind of get into it. Sometimes I'll get more specific because I'm super interested in business. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if I'm not familiar with your industry, it might stay more general. Uh, then we move into uh, four questions we've had brewing. Uh, what do you like to do for fun? If you could have a beer with anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? What are you currently reading? And most importantly, where can people find you? Mm -hmm. Um, normally the episodes are 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, if I get somebody who can talk like I can, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stop you. Okay. So let me refresh my memory <laughs> on the book. I just downloaded the Ray, Ray Dahlia book. Oh, you did. Um, it was awesome. I actually, uh, the changing world order, Ray Dahlia. Uh, yeah, those are all great. That's, that's your water. I know it's supposed to be beer. Uh, that's all right. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was going to bring us some bourbon or something. I just, I was, oh, yeah. I was just running late, but, uh, you know, he's going to bring us some old fashions or something. I don't have to drink bourbon. Well, uh, <laughs> the guy that this is on permanent loan from Chris. Okay. Um, if we got time after I walk you down there, this barrels is all there. He gets them from distilleries all over and okay. sells them furniture grade, liquid grade, sells cool. them breweries, whatever. Awesome. So yeah, I've had, uh, several different types straight out of the barrel mm. and it's not as awesome as you would think really it's it takes a little while to, to put their touch on it or something well i mean after they pull it out because of regulations and laws they got to cut it and so coming out of the barrel it's you know like molasses or something well it, it's strong yeah you know but it's it's good yeah put a little water in it to take the edge off yeah it's, it's excellent stuff but yeah, I'll uh I'll start and okay. rolling. So okay, we got some solid B roll. All right, here we go. Welcome back once again to the Business and Brew Show. I am super excited tonight uh, because we have Brian on, and I've actually uh, been connected with Brian for a minute, and now uh, I actually get to ask him all the questions I ask everyone else. So Brian, uh, really quick, tell us who you are and what you do. Awesome, uh, Brian Smith. Uh founder of iWatch Security. Uh, I'm from the West Coast originally, and uh, I love I love podcasting. I love listening to podcasts. I love, you know, content. And uh, I think, personally, I think growing up and making a bunch of mistakes as a young kid growing up and figuring things out, like 
I wish I would have had more good content that I could have plugged into. So uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we can share a little wisdom. Uh, you know, the, the saying is wisdom comes from experiences in a lot of cases, and it's usually mistakes. You know, you did this, don't do that again. You know, I'm not doing that again because you get burned, right? And you made a bad decision, but, but that's where wisdom comes from. So ultimately, I like to have conversations, uh, whatever they may be, whether it's differences of opinions, which is okay. Uh, but uh, I just, I love being able to give back whenever possible because, and I tell my kids this, like, you don't have to mis make the mistakes that I made. You know, the old saying military, you know, if you're going to walk through a minefield, follow somebody. You know, you don't, have, you don't have to blow a leg off. Just follow the guy that's been through here 12 times, right? So that's where, uh, that's where I think podcasting comes in. You get to learn from, from other people's mistakes and hopefully, you know, not blow a leg off when you don't have to. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> in blowing a leg off in business, I have other questions. For yeah, I, yeah it's, uh, <laughs> I've blown some of those legs off, believe me. Hmm. So uh, you said you're from the West Coast, so... Um, you know, maybe bring us up to speed, I guess, uh, kind of growing up and okay. what, I, I mean, you, you could go work for somebody. Why start your own business? Sure. And that's a good question. So, uh, I was born in Sacramento, California. Um, uh, I, I claim Phoenix, Arizona, although I, I went to high school in California, right outside of Compton, a uh, place called, uh, I lived in Colton, which is, uh, went to a high school in San Bernardino. It's kind of like the armpit of California. Um, but uh, a couple years there, uh, graduated uh, from high school in Phoenix, uh, 17 years old, 13 days after I graduated, I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Uh, we were the first or the uh, last uh, basic training uh, through there at Fort Dix. Then from there, I went to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, AIT, Fort Benning Jump School and ended up in uh, Fort Bragg, uh, January 2nd, 1993. So it's, I don't know why I remember that date. I just, I remember driving New Year's on the road and, uh, it was, so know. that was, that was your first duty station. Yeah. So that, that's why you first and last. Yeah. yeah. I just did my three and got out. So okay. got out for good behavior. Okay. Uh, but I did make Sergeant in two years, four months. I mm. felt like that was an accomplishment, uh, air assault, you know, school, uh, did some boards for the 82nd. So I, I think for, for three years, I think I, I did it pretty well. Uh, and, you know, I will tell you, being a military guy, you'll know this, like one of the things that I could have, I could have renewed for anything because of the the way I made rank and then my GT, ASVAB, whatever, GT score and so forth. And, and they couldn't have got, I, they couldn't have paid me anything to stay in. And it's not that I don't like the military. It's just, I realized that first off, you can't quit. So when you get these shitty duties or shitty chain of commands and like there was people that, that I worked with, but I was like, God forbid I ever have to go to war. And that dude or that chick is in charge of me. Like, seriously, you know, and it's, uh, and you know this, I mean, there's a lot of people that uh, they're just riding out. It's a government paycheck and they're just riding it out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I went in the military to, you know, cliche as it is, I wanted to be all I could be. I wanted to jump out of planes and be who, and I wanted to, you know, do that. And uh, it was honestly, permanent party was pretty disappointing overall for me. And that's, that was the 82nd. And it was like, if I'm going to stay in, the only thing I can stay in is really like go for Delta or Special Forces or, you know, Ranger. And that just didn't appeal to me. I wanted to get out and be my own business owner at that point, you know, be self-employed. And uh, I didn't like looking at the pay grade. And well, if I'm E48, uh, I'll make 110 grand a year. Best case scenario. And that's that it wasn't exciting to me. It's like, I want to be rich. I want to have my own plane. I want a Ferrari, you know, yeah, things like that. So. Um, always been kind of motivated like that. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. I, I feel like, um, you know, the correlations between the military and civilian side, and then you talk to people and people are like, I think that, uh, two years mandatory service should be a thing. And I'm like, no, and I'll tell you why, because you end up with the people who don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, and now you have to go empty a Connex or run a mission and you've got, you know, you're hard charging, you know, pulling your weight mm -hmm. along with everybody else's. And then you got those guys just kind of dragging along. Right. And, uh, I, I had a bunch of friends like you and they hit their, you know, when I was in a lot of the contracts were closer to five or six years. And, uh, one of my buddies, one of my best friends 
and he got to the end of his contract and I was like, why aren't you re-enlisting? Like your sergeant, you, you know, you got a lot, got a lot going for you. And he's like, I'm tired of being responsible for that guy's DWIs. Yeah. And that's, that's just the way it goes. But then, then we end up here. So, yeah. And uh, it's a, uh, it was a great experience. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, I think just about anything that doesn't kill you is a pretty good experience if you take, take away from it. Right. So, uh, I was fortunate that I never deployed. Uh, the closest we got was uh, was Haiti. You know, uh, I think that was ninety four. That's interesting. We we were on the tarmac. I mean, we were we were getting ready to go jump. They were passing out the little malaria pills and this and that. My understanding is we already had the drop zones cleared from uh, uh, the pathfinders and so forth. And I mean, my understanding is the plane was running. You know, and Jimmy Carter worked something out or some kind of peace deal over there, but. Uh, I remember because I didn't take my malaria pill, uh, even though they sat there and watched you do it. I tucked it away and I didn't swallow it. I spit it up when it came back up. And it's like, I'm not taking that shit until I actually, you know, <laughs> when I'm getting ready to jump, then I'll take it. I don't want to take it. And uh, so anyway, no, I'm not vaccinated with the COVID <laughs> vaccine either. Yeah. So um, so anyway, that's a, uh, that's a you know interesting little story, I guess. Yeah, the closest thing I ever saw to combat other than getting married. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said that because uh, my unit, the unit I left from Fort Polk, uh, actually went to Haiti. Louisiana. In, yeah, okay. in, uh, in 2010, they went handed out bottles of water. Okay. Took care of stuff. I went to uh, be a desk sergeant for MCOM and bomb holders. So hmm. they, they went to the heat and I went um, inside a building to not do anything for two Two years yeah, pros and cons right so, <laughs> it's a pretty pretty sweet deal but yeah you know. almost like your air force or something. Yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> we we got to share the barracks with them because you know income not a line unit like i All you right. know i gotta have my own room okay. <laughs> and stuff like that but, that's what it is right uh, uh so so you get out uh you want to do your own thing mm -hmm. um i could be wrong but your current business uh, maybe didn't look like this or didn't start like this. So. You, you know, it's funny. When I got out of the military, uh, I went into straight commission sales for a, actually a chemical plant in Dunn, North Carolina. Um, and uh, just doing sales, I was selling to companies or car dealerships, like tire dressing and stuff like that. Um, and uh, really got no training, really wasn't a great scenario. Uh, but I had my own schedule, uh, really wasn't making very good money. Um, but this was a learning experience. You know, it's, it's one of those things you win John Maxwell, you know, one of my favorite sayings is you win or you learn. Mm. And I, I did more learning back then when I got out of the military, cause it was tough. I had the reason why I stayed in this area was I had kids in an early age and my ex, uh, stayed in the military. And, uh, so I was kind of forced into hanging around cause obviously stayed around my kids. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, you know, you're, you're looking for a job. You're not college educated. I mean, I got out of the military when I was 20. So, you know, you're a sergeant from the military, you and 80, 80 other thousand people that just got out of the military this year, you know? So, I mean, I did, I did a wide range of stuff. I worked at Lillington Ford washing cars. I did detailing. Um, I was an assistant food and beverage manager at Woodlake Country Club for a while. Hmm. Um, you know, so I bounced around really trying to, I did property management in Fayetteville, uh, uh, North Carolina for, I don't know, 1800 a month or something. I don't even know how I lived back then, but, uh, you know, just bouncing around, really not really knowing what I could do. I just needed an opportunity. And what happened is uh, a friend at the time, his name was Frank. He, uh, he talked to me cause he started working for this company called protect America and they had telemarketing leads. And this was, 97, 98, right in that range. And uh, so he's like, hey man, you, you ought to come check this out. You'd be good at this. And I was I was all ears, right? I just needed to make money and kids. I was, you know, some people live month to month. I was living day to day, you yeah. know, it was, I remember buying Burger King Whopper combos and I would bring the change in with me, you know, it was $3 and 16 cents. Um, so I've been, definitely been poor before. Uh, but anyway, uh, got in the security industry, started running telemarketing leads and really uh, got horrific training. It was really pathetic. Uh, I ran 
literally my training and, and jump in anytime. I don't want to sit here and talk the whole time, but running leads, getting trained up. We went on two sales calls. The first one was a no-show, nobody there. Second one, he went in and he sold it and they their credit didn't qualify, so they weren't a customer. The next day I get a, a binder with like six pages in it, you know, a pay, a sheet with it in the plastic stuff. And I got some telemarketing leads the next day. Where did I go? Okay, I'm gonna so I'm gonna go in here. I'm gonna read this and you know just do the best <laughs> I can. And uh, um, any case, it was a rough start. My my first four days, I was driving my Camaro around, my '89 Irog Z28 Camaro nice. uh, that I loved. That the air conditioning was broken, and uh, driving that around. And uh, first day, four appointments, nobody home, or they canceled. Second day, you know, I'm telling Frank back then, I'm like, man, this, you know, is this going to happen a lot? Like I drove around all day, like I worked all day yeah. running these leads and no, it was garbage. He's like, man, that happens. Next day, same thing, four leads, all garbage. Mm. And so now I'm stressing out because I quit a salary job. I was working at House of Rayford uh, in, doing inside sales, basically supporting the outside reps. Uh, House of Rayford uh, selling turkeys, basically, in, in Rayford, North Carolina. Mm. Some of the jobs. But uh, um, but I left a salary position to go do this. And yeah. I was, you know, I could not make a mistake. I mean, I 30 bad days and I'm evicted. I'm behind in child support. Yeah. Like, <laughs> life is destroyed, right? Um, so, you know, I, I went into it like this, realistically. But uh, uh, so anyway, the third day, finally somebody's there. and. Uh, I ended up selling it, but it was, you know, this is where one of the, one of the things about my personality that, that I think helps me be self-employed. Um, and I, I coach people against this, uh, when they come to work for us, but I don't have to have it all figured out. I'm very adept at learning on the fly and I can get started and figure shit out along the way. Mm -hmm. So many people think they have to have all the answers before they move forward. And I think that, you know, Magic of Thinking Big is a book I read a long time ago. It goes that this failure disease is procrastination and detailitis. You know, you you're not going to figure everything out with with everything. You're just not. You have to start being able to move forward in a direction, and you have to be able to make a decision. And uh, this is actually uh, uh, Schwarzkopf. I think I'm saying that right. It's been a long time since I've said it, but Norman uh, Schwarzkopf, Desert Storm. You know, he he talked about the military, he would go into a scenario and, you know, typical government bureau bureau bureaucrats, bureaucracy, like nobody wants to make a decision because yeah. if you made the decisions wrong, you, you're nuts around the It was that guy. <laughs> yeah. And, and so he would go in and he would make a decision and just making a decision as a leader. So many people can't do it. But the reality is this is while you're sitting back there thinking about what to do, paralyzed from inaction, I make a decision, even if I'm wrong, I start going down the wrong path and I figure out I'm on the wrong path. Now I can turn around and start going down the right path. Meanwhile, you're still at zero and I might've gone backwards a little bit, but I end up forwards quicker than you because you just gotta make a decision, own your shit, you know, stay open to new information. And, if, and I have no problem saying, yeah, I was wrong, but I'm moving forward and I learned from it. And, and uh, you know what, I'm wrong, who cares? Yeah, but I'm moving forward. You you remind me of me uh, somebody once when uh, I I got involved uh, in selling on Amazon and uh, that's kind of what brought me to the position I'm in now. Okay. Um, but I you know held a, a presentation at the the Amazon meetup and um, we got done and he was like you're a doer and I was like explain yourself and he was like you just <laughs> You know, whatever it is, you just go do it. And mm -hmm. so now I explain to people, I describe myself as the guy who, if you told me to go dig a hole, mm -hmm. I would be using my hands yelling at someone, hey, go get me a shovel. Right. Because I'm just going to start, start working, getting it done mm -hmm. and figure it out along the way. That's and, it. Yeah. I mean, do you feel like uh, some of that or some other traits um, came from the military or do you feel like that's more of just who you are as a person? I think it's a combination. I think the military, I learned, I give the military a lot of credit for, for that kind of stuff. Like, for example, and I teach this in my organization, you know, don't come to me with complaints unless you come to me with solutions as well mm -hmm. and be, be willing to be part of the solution. 
you know, anybody can complain, you know, yeah, I, I can find 50 things wrong with the company right now. Who's going to fix it? You know, who's going to implement it? You know, so those are the things that, uh, um, that's one of the things I think the military did, but, but just being a doer, um, I don't know. It's a good question. It's a really good question because I think I got promoted quickly and, and a variety of things because I was the doer, because when you gave it to me, I would get it done. And I wanted to do it right. You know? Uh, so I think it was in there. I just think the military helped maybe refine it a little bit. Uh, Cause I was always the guy with the boots and the pressed, you know, pressed uniform and always liked to look the part and, and I think that's half the battle. You know, I think that's half the battle in sales and business ownership. I, I like looking the part, you know. Um, and then you got to know your shit. You got to be confident after that. And, and when you when you got those two things going for you, uh, I think it's a it's a real good thing. But I think I was the more I think about it, I think I had a lot of doer in me before. Um, and then the military just refined it. Yeah. Uh, and then you know what I think it did? I think the military rewarded me being a doer. By getting promoted quickly, by getting to go to uh, you know uh, air assault school, which is something I really push for, I think the military uh, in the chain of command that I had by rewarding me for being the doer, it kind of helped me. It uh, positive reinforcement, so I think it helped me become more of a doer, uh, while simultaneously kind of developing a little bit of a disdain for people that don't do. <laughs> because the, in reality, as the military, or in, in any job, really, it's like if you're doing your job and you do it excellent, well, just just give it to Ryan because he'll get it done. <laughs> Meanwhile, the shitheads, they they get less responsibility because they're not doers. They know if you're you're the boss and you give it to Ryan, he's going to make sure it gets done. And so there's good and bad with that. And I think the bad with that in the military is that guy's making as much money as I am, and I'm the one you know, that gets stuck with the shit because I'm going to make sure it gets done right. Whereas I think in private business, you know, that guy's not going to make what I'm going to make Yeah. because I'm more valuable. Yeah. And so that was one of the things I didn't like about the military is that shithead just, he's been here five years longer than I have. He's worthless. I'm getting stuff dumped on me and he's making more money than I am. All, all the guys that uh, you went in with got out as specialists E4. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know anybody that went in uh, my my range that got got promoted that quick, and and I was in a small unit in the eighty second Airborne Division. But uh, um, again, grateful for the experience. The number one thing about the military, and this is primarily military uh, audience, you think, or just in general? Uh, so I guess more business, okay. than anything. Okay, my, I mean. It, happy accident. A lot of my guests recently have been uh, okay. veterans. Okay. Uh, I am. So All right. um, they can probably just grin and bear. The one thing I like about the military that, that I really preach about uh, physical training, PT, you're out, you know, they're running your ass off. It's a five mile run. You're just hucking it, this and that. And you, you hit that corner and you're coming back towards the barracks and you're like, you're, you're finally, finally we're back, right? Finally. And they hang that left turn, mm -hmm. and then they they go burn your ass for another another mile, and half of the people would fall out. Yeah. The thing that I'm really grateful for about the military just that was mentally teaching you that you got to be prepared, you got to be able to do, to just deal with it when it comes up because it's usually not going to go right. And that that particular principle has served me really well. So in business, when people are pissing and moaning about this or something didn't go right or this and that, I'm like. Hey, shit happens. Just fucking let's get it done. Yeah. You know, and that mentality makes you more valuable than the guy who's pissing and moaning and, you know, he's shitting himself because he's got to work three hours late tonight. You know, it's like, dude, just get it done. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, I directly attribute that to the military in those freaking runs when they would <laughs> hang that left hand turn and run another mile, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was really proud to not be the guy falling out. Yeah. You know, that, that was, that was good for me. Of course, I'm not, you know, I wasn't 230 back then either. So. <laughs> I always tell people I, I can run forever. I'm just not fast. But, yeah, when <laughs> I, I had a, a platoon sergeant who would take us on the longest runs ever down at Fort Hood. And uh, 
we we would get so you know how it is there's like you know there's this turnaround point there's that turnaround point mm-hmm. and it was for the most part it was a straight line but depending on how he felt and what we were doing right depending on which one we would turn around at so he would always mess with us and when we got to the first one sometimes the second one we'd just keep running and running but when we would get there he might have us flip around just for a second, long enough to say something and then turn around and keep going. And he would say, oh, great news, guys. We're halfway to the halfway point. <laughs> like, ah. Mentally messing with you. Yeah. But so that's, that's... Once, once we get back, you know, now we ran seven miles. Right. Uh, everybody else is running four. But uh, we had the, the commander every time. You know, why Why are your PT failures uh, fewer than every other platoon? He's like, we only run it on days in and wise, sir. <laughs> makes sense, you know. It makes sense. So, uh, you you know, you went in, um, realized, hey, this is a really good experience. Uh, obviously, if you wanted some, you worked for it. You saw good results. You, you get out. Uh, I... I probably could have guessed that you had been in sales uh, just because I, I feel like a lot of business owners have had that experience before. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's definitely the cornerstone of what I've done. And I don't, it's tough for me to imagine not having a sales background, being self-employed, but uh, definitely start off in sales and home sales, ended up in branch manager. As a branch manager, that's what brought me to Raleigh. Uh, Raleigh was the uh, the office that nobody could do. Uh, mm. because we were we were notoriously straight commission uh, in sales. And that's another thing, like like people that, first off, if you, if you believe there's a pay gap and you, that bothers you, like, go into sales. <laughs> hey, realtors get paid whatever they get paid. It doesn't yeah. matter on your gender. So if, you, if you're upset at what you're being paid, you can always be self-employed. And uh, that way you, you write yourself whatever check you want. Um, of course, it's easier said than done. Sometimes getting paid what you're worth is not all it's cracked up to be. You know, uh, I probably make a lot less as a business owner right now than I I would as an employee. Uh, and I'll circle back around on that one maybe later. But uh, um, started off in sales, branch manager, and that's really where I'm grateful that I kind of found my niche. And I think that everybody has strengths and weak strengths and weaknesses. And I found out that I'm good in sales. I'm ethical. I think people people picked up on that. And I'll give you that first example, uh, that first sales call. The guy was asking me some questions that I didn't know answers to. And I would say, you know, I'm not 100% certain of the answer. I think I know, but I, I just want to call just to make sure. I don't want to tell you something wrong. And I'm sure the client knew, like, this kid doesn't know anything. You know, I'm, I'm like 23 at the time or something, 24 maybe. Um, let's see. Not, yeah, I'm about 23 at, at this point. But I would call up the toll-free number. Hey, Gil, who's the manager in Fayetteville, is Brian, I'm out here. You know, where's our monitoring station located? Uh, Mr. Such-and-such is asking me. Oh, oh okay, yeah. I, I thought that was it, which I didn't, you know. But uh, I had no idea. Yeah. And uh, I would get the answers for the customers, and I was learning along the way and, you know, feeling like a little bit of an ass because I didn't know that a lot of stuff. But I was learning along the way. Um, and I think the customer picked up on nice guy telling me stuff and he does, he's not lying to me. And then back then the product kind of sold itself a little bit, you know, free alarm system. What's the catch, you know, yeah. um, you know, you sign up for 30 bucks a month and you get the stuff for free. But uh, so that got me going and then branch management. And then uh, I grew Raleigh to the number one office in the country for that company. Um, and uh, really grew to the point where we were doing, I remember one month we were doing like 38% of the national company's volume out of my office. Uh, because I knew how to sell, I knew how to hire and train, and I, I felt like I was a good leader training people and stuff, and I, I give the military a lot of credit for that as well. It's, uh, you know, PLDC, you know, Primary Leadership Development Course, you got to take that to become a sergeant. I'm, I'm glad you uh, spelled it out, because when I uh, finally got to go, that's a long story, but it was ALC. Advanced leadership course. Okay. Yeah, they right. change the letters like once every four years. <laughs> got to keep everybody on their toes, right? Yeah. But uh, so that was uh, that was back then. But and then uh, I worked for that company for a while, and then uh, I got recruited away to another company. Uh, circumstances changed with that company, 
Uh, and then I started my first security company in 2004 with a few other people and uh, ended up selling that company in 2009 uh, for a wide range of reasons uh, to definitely include, uh, you know, builders were going under left and right, the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. uh, I got stuck for probably a hundred grand just in builders going under with TVs and audio systems and all that stuff we were doing back then. Um, but uh, in any case, started I Watch Security. It uh, let's see, 2010. So we've, we've been in business for about 11 years now. We do camera systems, security systems, uh, both commercially and residentially. We've got clients from uh, the governor's personal house to Jordan Stall of the Hurricanes uh, to uh, the North Carolina Department of Revenue. So we've got a, a wide range of clients, and we're we're one of the highest rated companies in the uh, in the state, actually. Cool. So we love competing against ADT and CPI, the big names. Uh, and uh, we love educating people about do your self security and how easy it is to defeat it, things like that. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely interesting because uh, I don't think you talked about your MLS. Uh, 94 Bravo. So that's actually a funny story. Uh, Cook, basically. Okay. So I went it's like uh, back then, uh, mine would have been 95 Bravo. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. My uh, my good friend of high school, Jeremy, he wanted to be a chef. So I didn't really, I just wanted to go in the military and be cool, right? So we were going to go in the military together. And uh, of course, the recruiter paints a little bit different picture. I don't know, you know, you stupid kid, you know, <laughs> like I'm going to be running around. I'll know what berries to eat in the jungle or something. I didn't, I didn't realize I'd be wearing cook whites, you know. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, we, we go into to, uh, MEPS. I take my test, I sign everything. He comes out, he failed the ASVAB. <laughs> and so he never yeah, never went back to do it. And I go sh get shipped off doing something he wanted to do. So you're like, where are you going, man? I know, and I, I end up in, in his MOS. So, um, and I, I despised it. I hated, I hated cooking. I hated cook whites. I hated all that really bad. Um, and then being in the 82nd, we were always short. So we're on one shift and we just worked our asses off. Um, everybody's on holiday. It's like, well, the mess hall's open. Yeah, I'm fucking working again, you know? <laughs> and uh, I mean, it just sucked. It really sucked, Yeah, to be honest. And uh, there's no, they couldn't have given me a million dollar signing bonus. I wouldn't have done, I, God's honest truth. They could have given me a million dollars to to do this until you retire. And I just said, no, mm. as broke as I was, you know? So um, despise that. So that's why you do different things, though. You, you, when I got out of the military, you start working, you try this, you try that. I learned I'm terrible at administration, spreadsheets. You know, even as a business owner, I can't stand QuickBooks, reporting, putting reports together, gathering data. I love to look at the data and analyze stuff. Uh, but when it comes to doing taxes or bookkeeping or anything administrative, I just despise. Get me in a podcast, get me talking in front of people. <laughs> Get me in sales calls, you know, uh, hiring people, training people. That's really what where I have high energy for. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. I, I like being around people, or mm -hmm. you know, whatever the the management leadership aspect, right. uh, wherever I can insert myself there. But uh, the reason I, I brought up MOS is mm -hmm. because you know I was an MP. Um, actually, a good friend of mine and one of my mentors from the military. Uh, he now does what he did in the army because as an MP, you can go through physical security school. Uh, and now he does that for <clears throat> 20 times the salary yeah. that he was doing in the army. Sounds um, about right. He, he retired. So he got his 20 years and then moved on and uh, now does, does really well for himself. But it's kind of, kind of up your alley. I feel like his, at least one of his roles while we were in the military was basically to go around all the bases and break it. So like, uh, there's your hole, and, sure. and he was super creative with it too. So it was it was a little embarrassing, especially like if it was my job, and now he's showing up at my base, and I'm like, ah, oh, cool man. Now you're pointing out holes and yeah, my and our job. stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble. But uh, so it, you guys like obviously help residential and commercial clients mm -hmm. with their security. Um, I'm sure set up installation, whatever, how, like, what is that? Of course you have the introduction, but like, what does the sales cycle look like? Mm -hmm. um, well, normally we just meet with folks and uh, ultimately we want to help them make an educated decision because there's, 
there's so many smart things out there now to where um, as part of the security system, you got the door locks, cameras, thermostats, flood detection, fire detection, and all of that stuff can be integrated with the security system. And one of the things I wrote an article for a, a magazine here recently was, you know, when smart devices are dumb. And they're, they're dumb when they're not talking to each other. So if you've got a, let's say, a Nest thermostat and it's smart, well, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, however, if with your alarm system, you have our thermostat, which is the same or less money, and we, we install it, and then the security system has a smoke detector inside the home, well, when the, the smoke detector detects smoke inside the home, it tells the alarm system, Obviously, the alarm goes off, wakes people up. You get your text message in five seconds. You get your phone calls, dispatch if necessary. But what it also does is it tells the thermostat to shut down. That way, the thermostat is not pumping in oxygen mm. to the fire. So it's everything smarter when it works together. You know, it's it's great to have a door lock in case your kid forgets his key or, you know, I lost my key as a kid multiple times, um, being a latchkey kid, single mom. Um, but now with the door lock, let's say the cleaning company, grandma, your kid, they come home, they put in their code in the front door, it unlocks the door, but it turns off the alarm system as well. Hmm. And you can have a variety of things. Let's say you put in your code to unlock the door where well, you can record that video clip and send it to dad, make sure the daughter's not walking in with her boyfriend, right? Um, you could have lights come on, you could have, you know, uh, heat lamps turn on to where it's, you know, smells good in the house or what have you. So you can have so many things connected and by one action, uh, you can even Bluetooth stuff. So when you pull up your house knows your home and it just turns off. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things that you can do uh, that ultimately when we meet with clients and help them get educated about it, it's like our prices are great or better than doing all the stuff on your own. And it's all on one platform. Uh, and it's not easily hacked. I mean, Ring recalled like 300,000 doorbell cameras. They're, they were catching houses on fire, you know, doorbell cameras. Um, you may or may not have seen, you know, Ring cameras being hacked and stuff like that. Racial slurs or some guy talking to, you know, uh, your kids in the kitchen and some guys saying Santa Claus, you know, come out front. I'm going to come see you. I mean, people just hacking into your stuff because the do it yourself stuff is made to be easy. Yeah. You know, whereas, with our stuff, I've, I've never heard of, it's alarm.com is the platform. It's not something we created, uh, but they're publicly traded in there. I've never heard of alarm.com, any devices getting hacked you know, or where someone's looking at your stuff, you know? You know I've, I've heard of that and uh, I started asking questions of people because um, we, we don't have anything crazy like that. I, I mean, we're working on buying our first house. So mm -hmm. sure. uh, it, you may be getting a call from me, but okay. I, I I said uh because my dad has the ring and I asked him and he I feel like he even said one time that he saw or he came home or something and the garage door was open and there was apparently no concern there was like nothing that happened but I'm like what happens when your your neighbor gets home and they use the garage door opener and that opens your garage door or something like that and then those crazy ones with like the I guess the devil voice or whatever coming through the smart home because somebody hacked into it. I've seen those videos and I'm like, if I'm gonna get a doorbell like one of those smart doorbells or a system like that, like I don't want somebody coming through my internet yeah. and controlling it and messing with it. And that's what, that's why I asked those questions. And yeah. I had a buddy that was like, yeah, you just got to do your research and go with a company that doesn't have those types of problems. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's one of those things that I think any technology can probably be hacked. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's uh, um, it's not prevalent. It's not something that, you know, Russia is not trying to look into my house. You know, the KGB is not targeting me. If they wanted to, I'm sure they can get into my stuff. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, the, the other thing I'll say about home security, since you're talking about it, and security in general, is cameras are not security. This is the biggest thing we're dealing with right now. People think cameras are security. And first off, you can buy a $5 part that'll plug into your phone and it'll jam Wi-Fi signal. So if you've got Wi-Fi cameras around your house, I got my camera. It's illegal, but it's it's not terribly difficult to do. 
So I can walk up to your house and it'll it'll blind anything that's on the Wi-Fi. And you've got do-it-yourself systems that are operating on your Wi-Fi. Cameras are on the Wi-Fi. Um, so, you know, it knocks out all of that. So um, that's the biggest thing. And, and then even if they don't knock it out, I just kind of joke around about it. It's like, I don't, I don't want the cops to, to have a video of the guy with the hat and the mask that killed me. Yeah. You know, he got into my house and he killed me while I was sleeping. I don't, I don't care if they have video of that. Yeah. You know, I want the alarm to go off at three in the morning so I can grab my nine, which is very close by and, you know, Handle protect business. myself. <laughs> yeah. Protect myself. And, yeah. and I, you know, I don't need the cops. Yeah. They might need the coroner, <laughs> um, but you know, we, at the end of the day, I just, I use the military thing all the time because you, you get the macho guys, oh, I don't need security. They come in here, I got something for them. It's like, well, that's the number one item they want to steal, number one. Yeah. Number two, if your weapons are not protected, some shithead steals your stuff and does something with it. Now you're putting my guns at risk yeah. because you didn't protect your weapons. Uh, but number three, we had lots of guns at Pearl Harbor. You know, It doesn't matter when they catch you off guard. You know, it's one of those things that you got to have some reaction time. You know, I don't want to come home and somebody's in my closet. Yeah. Because yeah, they got you. I told them uh, down here we were discussing options about uh, cameras that already exist and, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not we should get more. And I said, well, really all that does is tell them who did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's like we can find it. Yeah, we can find the person right and, you know you said the mask person a guy with a hat and a mask on which is very yeah. common well, yeah. well, now maybe you get a, an idea of his body type and his eyes yeah you know and so. if it's at night you can get some grainy video if it's dark so these are all the things that we talk about and, and at the end of the day when you're talking about your home and your family monitored security system should be number one then secondly is cameras to complement that. That's the way it should be, based on my opinion, doing this 23 years and just looking through all the scenarios. Um, so that's my two cents for what it's worth. That that and five bucks that and five bucks will get you a latte at Starbucks. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so you you've been running the, the company for eleven years. Um and knowing that you're you know more of the the, the hands-on people person mm -hmm. um what is what does your process look like when do you get involved mm -hmm. in new hires uh how involved are you with them and um how how much training you know especially given your experience mm -hmm. how much training do you offer before you kind of kick them to the curb <clears throat> well i think it depends on the position but and we're still relatively a uh, smaller organization but when we hire someone if they're not coming with with uh, they're not coming with any skills. You have to run them through the gamut. For example, if they're in sales, they're going to do a lot of ride-alongs. We're going to be getting them on the internet. We're going to be, uh, you know, ideally tell them, tell them, call up CPI. Tell them you want to quote for your house. Have them try to sell you, so you can understand what they're what they're doing. And then call ADT and call Simply Safe. You know, call these companies to get an understanding. And after you've spent a little bit of time with us, and then I want you to come back and, and you know, ask me the questions. Well, CPI said they're using their own monitoring station. Well, that's true. And they don't subcontract their monitoring. Well, that's true. But that's also because it's in their best interest. And so I, I handle the objections with them. They say that, but they're, they're subcontracting their technology just like we do. It's alarm.com. They subcontract the cell phone towers just like we do. They're typically Verizon, just like we do. So they're subcontracting 66.6% .6 of the process. We're subcontracting 100%. And so that, you know, basically walking those new people through those scenarios and, and understanding what the competition's saying, understand what we offer, how it stacks up against. And, you know, here's the other thing. Give the competition props when they deserve the props. You know, like, hey, CPI is a good competitor. ADT? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I ever got out of the industry, that's what I say to people. If I ever got out of the industry, I'd consider CPI. I would never consider ADT. Take yeah. that for what it's worth. Yeah. You know, um, but that's doing something for 23 years as well. Um, so, uh, so that's our training process. It depends on the person. Uh, some people pick it up quicker, but it's it's a lot of ride-alongs. A technician, you're going to spend two to four weeks with 
at a minimum two to four weeks working with Raphael or one of our senior guys or uh, just being a being a little bitch boy. Uh, the uh, the nug we call him nugs the new ugly guy. Did you use that in the military? No, no it was it was nugget. FNG. My dog's name is Nugget, mm. so we call him New All right. or call him Nug. Okay. FNG. So this this is yeah. you just opened a whole different door. <laughs> like that. Yeah, we call them FNGs in the army, but okay. Nug, Nug, New Ugly guys. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, I always just tell people it's like it's going to be on your you know. I'm not going to shove you out there because it's my reputation on the line, but you need to let me know when you're ready. And, you know, for example, in scholar, he, he works and as, as a good trainer, he's going to, okay, just sit back and shut up, you know, let me, let me do the whole first job and get to understand the next job. I'm going to show you how to do these sensors and these sensors. Uh, so they learn along the way. Now it's going to be, okay, you're going to do the job and I'm going to sit back and I'm not going to do anything today. You're going to do it all. You're going to talk. You get in a jam. Just look at me. I'll know you're struggling with something. They ask you a question. But that's where it's you're watching me. Then you're doing it with me. And then you're doing it while I'm watching. And then get to the point where you you did the whole job. I'll just go do some basic stuff to help out with. But then it's like, all right, you're ready for your first job. You know, and a good rule of thumb. Don't do anything the first time without asking somebody. Don't You don't get paid to make decisions. You know, you get paid to execute. And so if there's a question mark about something, text Raphael, text me. You know, I'm very liability conscious as a business owner. You know, Don't make decisions. Well, it's not your role. It, it kind of it kind of reminds me of the military or like my my brother owns a plumbing company and he's he's very similar. He's like at the end of the day, if you're talking about digging a ten foot ditch, you know might as well just make that phone call like right. you're talking about a huge job like you you know just go ahead and break some ass real right. quick and here's the thing if Raphael said it well, you're good it's on Raphael now yeah and Raphael has to talk to me how'd you come up with that decision you know because Raphael has he's my senior guy he's, yeah. he's got the ability because I, I trust his decision making and if he makes a mistake we're going to have a conversation we're going to talk about it we're going to learn from it and move forward you know but that's one of the one of the my weaknesses as a leader over the years has been being too much of a mama hen, too much of maybe a little bit of a control freak, not letting go of stuff, having processes running through me too much. Um, so that's that's something I've had to work on over the years to where it stagnates the growth of the company. If I have to make every decision, well, people need everything to run through me. Mm. You know, it, it bottlenecks a lot of the the activity and decisions and. Uh, ultimately doesn't the people don't grow as well so you gotta so what gotta what have you go. done to to like address that how do you you know if you're used to something how do you kind of switch that you know i think you, you got to just set the expectation for example with julie is my i call her my hmfic which is a military <laughs> um, but you know, when she was dealing with switching the phones over, we re recently switched from uh, AT&T to Verizon because uh, AT&T is teaching white people as a problem and that sort of thing. So I didn't want them feeling guilty with my money. And so, um, <laughs> but I, I basically told her, I said, go ahead and do it. Just, you know, make the decisions, gather the information, and we'll talk about it. And so we've got to the point where there's enough of that that she knows how I think. She knows what I'm going to say before I say it because we've worked together for a couple of years now. And so there's this high level of trust. Same thing with Tom, who's the VP of sales. Same thing with Raphael at this point. So I've got a lot of people that we've worked together for a long time that that a lot of times they're gonna, they know what I'm going to say before I say it. And so I think when you get that level of trust, it's like, okay, you know, he'll ask me this and that and I'll say, you handle that, Rob. You know, I'll just, I'll start turning it over to him. Go ahead. I, I trust your judgment on this one. You know, let's talk about it. And then I'll circle back around like, what'd you do? You know, how'd you handle that? Well, I did this. You know, all right. That's cool. That's probably what I'd have done. Or maybe think about it this way next time. I'm not saying you did a bad job, but maybe think about ABC and possibly XYZ, you know, and, and well, what happens if this? And I try to get them thinking a couple steps ahead. Um, almost like chess sometimes when it comes to dealing with customers. Like, 
okay, you told the customer that, well, what happens? What's the next step? And are you prepared for that next step? So what's your plan if that happens? You know, so especially with technology, uh, it's just a pain in the ass uh, sometimes, but <laughs> it's uh, it's great when it works. It's awesome yeah. when it works. So that's the thing. I think you just got to give people a little bit of freedom at a time, at, at, at a little bit at a time, um, coach them up along the way. And the thing that I've, learned over the years is not to be such a, sh a sergeant, not to be such a hard ass when someone makes a mistake. Um, that's something I've, I've, I think I'm a much better business owner now than I was 12 years ago like that. I mean, I would, I could flip out and be very condescending and that sort of thing. And, and uh, just cause it didn't go right, you know? Yeah. And it's like, well, I got to give these guys grace. You know, they're learning on the fly. And, and that's probably why, you know, I've retained people better this time around as a business owner than from 2004 to 2009, um, just being less of a hard ass. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess um, I, I think very similar to kind of the, the hard ass mentality, mm -hmm. um, especially obviously because of my military experience. I, I have found in the moment, especially if it's one on one or you know if it's my guys that I I I guess when presented with the situation, I have a tendency to be a little bit more patient. Mm. Um, and sometimes I wonder if that's not to a fault because I I never want to be so lenient that people feel like they can walk all over me. Sure. But um, I I am kind of impressed just thinking about it how. I can maintain calm when it gets down to the wire. I will tell you if things don't do what they're supposed to, I, I yell and cuss. Yeah. But you know, it's just the thing. It's the, the leveler on the dock, you know, right. just breaking on us. We can't get it to do what, what it's supposed to. Do. So I feel like you talked a, a little bit about your, your technicians and installers. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, uh, got to, do a lot of sales um i think i think i have roughly about three years uh full commission sales experience uh, as well as the fact that i believe uh pretty much every position has some form of sales involved mm -hmm. in it sure uh if you were to choose um who you hired as salespeople, uh whether they have a little uh, no experience a little experience or a lot of experience mm -hmm. which one and why that's an interesting question. I think it depends on the person. Um, I like someone with, uh, without experience probably because they're not bringing a bunch of garbage with them. But then again, someone with experience, uh, depending upon the person, depending upon the organization they're coming from, uh, they can be a real asset as well. So I don't know, that's a tough question, but if I had to lean one way or another, I'd probably say starting from scratch because, you know, you're not dealing with, well, this is how we did it over there. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, that's why you're a one-star company over there. You know, yeah. that, that's why their Yelp reviews look like dog shit. And ours, you know, we're the highest rated in the state, you know? So, and that sounds cocky, but it's like, you just have to kind of deal with that mindset that, well, you know, why'd you do it that way? Well, let's really drill down into why you're doing it that way. Is it easiest for you or is it best for the customer? Mm -hmm. Is it efficient? Is it productive for the company? You know, and so I, I just think you deal with more of that versus I'd rather have, you know what I'd rather have? I'd rather, I want a young Brian Smith. Man, I would go through freaking walls for a hundred grand, grand a year. I was willing to learn. I was willing to listen. Six days a week, 12 hours a day, I was a machine. Because when I finally got an opportunity that I could make money and I could get ahead and pay child support and pay all my bills and get a Corvette and, you know, like I actually started living a good life. It's like, man, I was so motivated, you know, and uh, I didn't have any industry experience when I first started. Yeah. I was just a young, moldable, uh, you know, ambitious, you know, probably borderline cocky for some reason. But, you know, I, I just always had a belief in myself that I could do well. So I think I'd rather start from scratch with if I have the choice. Um, especially in a straight commission scenario. So a lot of your veterans are going to want some kind of guarantees or this and that, you know, and, and they get guarantees, but you don't. Yeah. You know, it's like, 
you know, especially, I mean, full commission. I, I, I think I agree with you, you know, um, I like, I like training people in sales and, uh, I've, I've seen that. Of course, I, I will say I had one guy. Uh, I I trained him when I was in sales, and uh, he was just an old soul. Um, I want to say he was in his forties, maybe. And at the time, I was late twenties, mm -hmm. uh, and he just didn't take much. It was basically like we went down the company requirements, mm -hmm. basically. And then he just took it from there and he was a talker and he was yeah. a people person that pretty much did it for him. Yeah. So. He's, sounds like he's wired for sales. Yeah. Oh, some people very, are, some people are so. not, you know. He, it was one of those things where one of my biggest concerns, and I could kind of always tell when I interviewed someone, when we got to the pay structure, whether or not they were going to be like, oh, it's full commission, let's go. Or, oh, it's full commission, I got to go, you know. And we got to that point, and he didn't flinch, he didn't blink. Um, he had a couple of questions, but he was like, yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. I sell the thing, and then you guys pay me. And, and what a lot of people don't know, if, especially if you're listening to this, a lot of times when you're straight commission, you're getting max value because the company has no cost until you produce. So I, I can pay you more. Because I'm not, I don't have all this miscellaneous cost. When you have someone on, let's say you have 10 people on salary. Well, the reality is you're making less as a top producer than that slug because the company has to look at the salaries in a whole. So you're actually helping the, the lower producing people and you're actually limiting yourself versus if you were full commission. Uh, and as a business owner, I'm straight, still straight commission. You know, if the company is is lean on money, I'm the last person to get paid. Mm -hmm. You know, I've not paid myself multiple, multiple, countless times before uh, for payroll because, you know, you got receivables or this or that. And um, I'll tell you, everybody in, in the company has had a pay raise in 2021 except for me. You should talk to the boss about Yeah, that. my boss is an asshole. <laughs> you know? But uh, it, at the end of the day, it's like I'm playing for the long term, though. Yeah. You know, and and don't feel bad for me. I mean, I'm you know I'm going to get by this year. But uh, at the end of the day, it's like I I don't I'm trying to generate net worth at this point in my life. I'm 47. Uh, you know, this is this has got to be uh, this is going to work for me, and I'm going to make it work. And um, there's a lot of times where, I mean, we just bought five computers, we just bought a new truck, we do all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's well, I'd rather give my people raises this year. We're doing our dinner, uh, Christmas dinner at Sullivan's. I'm going to drop probably three grand on dinner. You know, we got some holiday bonuses and stuff like that. It's because I want to take care of my people because the people take care of the company. Yeah. And my employees are my number one customer. Yeah. So I want to take care of my customers. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that's that's my thought process on it. Yeah, just uh, I mean, I I like how you talk about stuff like that, and and how your uh your turnover now is not as high as it was previously. Yeah. Um, so you know, getting getting to you know take care of the your team, and you know put a lot of focus on them. Uh, I'm I'm definitely curious because if your turnover used to be bad, but mm -hmm. you were able to make those adjustments, uh, what are some other things, you know, maybe as far as the relationships that you feel contribute to you being able to retain folks? You know, that's a great question. Um, and, and by the way, uh, on a side note, I like talking about controversial, controversial stuff a little bit. So okay. I don't believe in a $15 minimum out, minimum wage. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that. But everybody that works for me makes makes more than that. Yeah. So it's it's all relative to the business, and it's 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 all relative to the value that you provide. Um, so anyway, that's that's just a little side note. But I'll tell you one mistake that I've made in the past that I don't make anymore is, um, unfortunately, when you work with someone for a long time, initially when someone first starts working for me, you know, you're the boss, right? Yeah. You're the CEO of the company, you're the boss, you're the founder. There's a certain level of respect that you're normally going to get. 
but over time, you're Brian, you know, and I am a friendly person. I'm treat people good. And there's a lot of people that I've treated really well over the years that end up becoming entitled, that end up uh, kind of taking you for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a fine line now between I have great rapport with people, but we're not necessarily buddies outside of the office. We're not going fishing together every weekend. I don't fish, but not the one with fishing, but um, you know, as an example, um, and I might go to a hockey game with, with someone to take the employee for doing a great job kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we might go grab lunch, you know, just to have a sit down once in a while. And how's it going, man? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? What's going on with your family? You know, how's it going with the house hunting? You know, just so I'm engaged, but I think there's a certain distance that I keep as well. Uh, and that's worked better for me. Yeah. Um, because when you when you when you become Brian instead of boss, then it's like, oh man, you're being an asshole. It's like, man, it's my fucking company. This is the way we're gonna do it. And and then egos get involved. And so it's just it it creates conflict sometimes, I think, if you get too close. And that's where you see people that are, you know, they work together with family. You know, it usually ends bad. Yeah. You know, it's because you're just Joe. Hmm. Yeah, if you want to get biblical, there's a um you know, did you know Jesus could not do miracles? I don't know if you have any Christian background, but yeah, this real, this real. I'm listening. So, so there was a place Jesus couldn't. It said he could not do any great works or miracles, and that was in Nazareth because when he went back there, it's a, it's a. I think it's a proverb. I think it's a, a, a prophet in his own town has no honor. Hmm. Um, and so they're like, ah, that's just Jesus. He's just the carpenter. You know, so. Um, the unbelief was so bad that I apparently couldn't do miracles. This is a Bible story, but um, but I think that translates to when you're a business owner, oh, you're just, that's just Ryan. Yeah. Versus, that's, that's Ryan, that's fucking boss, dude. You need to relax, you know, do what he says. Yeah. You know, versus, ah, oh, it's just Ryan, man. He's just having a bad day. He's being a jerk today. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, he's the boss. Do it his way. Yeah. You, know? you, you can always leave the company as well if you don't like that. Yeah. I, I I feel like we saw some of the same things, you know, in the military, uh, you know, even when I got promoted, I'm in the same platoon in the same squad, mm -hmm. uh, but now they want me to be in charge of the two guys that we were just out drinking beers last night. Mm -hmm. it's, it's similar, like, similar thing. Yeah. It's like, I'm not going to listen to you. Right. Why are you being a dick, man? Like, like do, I'm not doing pushups. No, no. <laughs> it's the same thing that's that's like a lot of time that's why they move people out of units and stuff yeah you know? I, which you know you were in a couple of years before me uh but i i heard of that you would get promoted and they would do some sort of you know within the battalion or whatever um but then when i got promoted and other i started to see other people go from specialist to sergeant uh specialist to corporal and they were in the same squad and they would just give them a team of people from that squad. And I'm like, I, I just don't think this is really good, especially mm -hmm. for, uh, for corporals with implied authority. Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it, it never worked out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they, they kept doing it. I mean, a lot of those people saw further success. So eventually they would PCS or whatever and, and move on. But, mm -hmm. I think there's a le lesson to be learned there. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. And if Jesus couldn't do miracles, it's a pretty big deal, you know. Yeah, right. Um, but uh, um, so that would be something that I definitely learned. Uh, what was what was the question? It was uh, about learning, hiring, and training people. What did I learn? Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm really just curious, like what uh, your development process looks like, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you bring people in, you train them. Um, it, it sounds like you do pretty well at, at building those relationships with people and it contributes to your, your retention. But I think so, yeah. It's, it sounds like you 
you know, we were talking about a book earlier that you read. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're obviously into personal growth and self-development. Definitely. Yeah. So how do, how do you communicate that, especially if you get someone, you know, maybe they're a top producer and they couldn't care less about a book. Like, how do you uh, kind of share the love, so to speak? How do, how do you motivate them to grow? Yeah. Um, I think just by being the example, I think you got to just... Uh, when you're having conversations with people and you're you're leading them to success and you're you're they're getting value from what you're talking about and one of the things that i i will do is i will reference books a lot you know for example rich dad poor dad was a great book you know and it talks about uh the difference between wealthy and poor people it's it's uh poor and middle class people work for money rich people have their money working for them and so when I talk about a principle and I reference a book a lot, so it, that might be one book that I'm referencing talking about money management. You know, um, if I'm talking to a salesperson about uh, Secrets of Closing the Sale by Zig Ziglar, one of the things I remember from that book is in, in the, you know, the government does this all the time. It's uh, when they were trying to pass cap and trade, which was basically raising our energy bill. The government, what they're saying, oh, it's less than the cost of a stamp a day. Well, that's sales 101. I, right when I hear it, I know what's going on. So if I'm talking to you and your, your spouse about a security system, and I'm $5 a month more than CPI, I'm going to say, listen, man, it's, it's like 12 to 15 cents a day to do it right and, and get the local service that you're looking for. It's this and that. So I, I reduce it to a small amount. Well, you know. It's a, it's a dollar. It's, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, 30 cents a day is 10 bucks a month, right? But if, if uh, so if I'm more expensive, I'm going to reduce it to the smallest amount, which is a day. And that way it's, it's like 12 cents a day, dude. It's, it's no big deal. And you're like, ah, it's only 12 cents a day. No big deal. I'm going to go with this company. But if CPI is more than I am, let's say they're $5 a month more than we are. Well, I'm going to say, well, Man, that's five bucks a month. I said over the course of that five-year contract they want, that's three hundred dollars. You know, so if it's if I'm more expensive, I'm breaking it down to a small amount. If they're more expensive, I'm multiplying it towards three or five-year contract. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. It's just I'm putting the spin on it. And so ultimately, when the government's saying, "Well, it's just the cost of a stamp a day," I, they're using the sales technique. <laughs> And so, well, yeah, 50 cents a day times 356 days a year, that's like 150 bucks, right? You know, you, you're, trying to, you're trying to raise my energy 150 bucks and every single person, you know, so, but that's when I'm talking about that to a salesperson or someone I'm trying to get motivated. If I can teach them something and keep referencing books, yeah. then they start realizing like, okay, well, that makes sense. So we got it from that book or we got it from that book. And uh, I think that's one good way to kind of lead people to, you know, um, if you want to, if you want to, Albert Einstein, he said the, uh, it, it, I'm going to paraphrase it, it's foolish to, the same level of thinking that got you in this mess is not going to get you out of the mess. What got you here won't get you there. <laughs> what got you here won't get you out. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the time. So you got to stay, you got to keep getting new information and you got to keep changing your perspective. Um, and I just, I love conversations, uh, you know, about vaccines or <laughs> COVID or uh, mandates. I mean, I enjoy those conversations. I kind of enjoy political stuff as well uh, because it's, I don't know what I don't know. Yeah. And that way I'm always open to new information. Um, one of my favorite sayings is this, is what do you clean your ears with? Q-tips. Q-tips, you don't. Oh! You clean yours with cotton swabs. Yeah. Q-tips is the brand. Yeah. And we're all branded. We all are. So that's why, you know, for example, if someone says, oh, they're, they're telling me about global warming and this and that and blah, 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 without me even taking a side, I say, okay, well, sounds like you're really passionate about climate change and global warming. Let me ask you this. How much has the temperature increased? And they get the this look over their face. It's like, if you're telling me about climate change, the one thing you should know, the one thing you should know is how much it's increased. And if you don't know, you might be running around talking about Q-tips. 
<laughs> and we're all capable of it. But yeah. I just that's where I that's where I like asking questions. Um so and I'm not saying I do or don't believe in it. I'm just <laughs> I got questions. That's all. Yeah. You know, yeah, North Pole is shrinking, but Antarctic is growing. What does that mean? You can Google it. It's fact. Yeah. You know, polar bears, you know, they should see the polar bears swimming around in the North Pole. Well, the polar bear population has tripled in the last 30 years. Look. What's that mean? I don't know. I, I'm all about taking care of the earth, you know. Have you ever, so I know you're a book guy. Have you ever uh, seen the movie Zombie Land with Woody Harrelson? I did, yeah. yeah. And then there he's. He's like, you're like a penguin on the North Pole telling a penguin on the South Pole. It's the nicest time of year. And Jesse Eisenberg goes, uh, there, are, there are no penguins on, on the, the North Pole or whichever one. And Woody Harrelson just looks at him and goes, do you want to feel how hard I can punch? <laughs> I don't remember that. That's, a, that's what the whole polar bear thing made me think of. But yeah, uh, just I, I feel like, you know, referencing the books you get people's attention um it's kind of reinforcement next thing you know they're like okay well he knows this stuff because he read that book so you know maybe i should i should read that book so do you uh read most of your books um do you get hard copies or is it audiobook or i would say i'm probably 80 percent audiobook okay. um, over the last few years um, I used to be in a really good habit. I'd love to get back into it. Uh, I would read 15 minutes in the morning and read before bed, just that positivity to start your day. Uh, I'm out of the habit. I would love to get back in it. But uh, audiobooks for me are super convenient when you're going down the road and you know, squeeze in 15, 20 minutes here and there. Uh, we were just talking about the audiobook that uh, I just downloaded, Ray Dahlia. Um, and it's nice sometimes to just unplug, to shut the brain down, kind of unplug from work or whatever you're dealing with and just get some good positive input. Yeah. But uh, I like audiobooks. In a perfect world, I can sit down and read. And uh, the advantage to reading is I really used to highlight a lot of stuff that would jump out at me. And that way you could always go back and pick up the book and just scour through what you highlighted within three minutes. And you kind of re refresh your memory of all the stuff that jumped out at you. The other thing I like doing too is going back, rereading a book that you hadn't read in a long time. Yeah. You know, all of the things that you highlighted, yeah, that's great. But then there's all these other things that are jumping out at you now because you're in a different place mentally. Yeah. And it's like when someone says, oh, yeah, yeah, I read that book. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, there's, there's audio books I've listened to 10 times. Yeah. Uh, because, I hear things differently now than I might have a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. Um, great book, uh, Never Split the Difference by uh, Chris Voss, yeah. former hostage negotiator. I mean, there's, there's so much wisdom in that book. You, uh, you're, you're one of many people to bring it up, and I, I don't think I've that guy, listened to that The guy's yet. awesome. Yeah. I mean, just imagine this. It's like, you know, he's an FBI negotiator, and you know, your, your family's kidnapped in Haiti or something like that, and he's got to get them back, and he, he doesn't really have much money to work with. I mean, how do you, how do you work through that, you know? And for him to, uh, it's tactical empathy. Mm. It's, it's like, you know, like Jedi, Jedi mind trick, that you can really implement a lot of that kind of stuff just by tactical questions and listening and understanding their personality type and, and really... You know, people want to be understood, and if you can, if you can give people the respect that you're really deeply listening to them and you care about them, you can get a long way. And so that's that's really a lot of the book is about that kind of stuff. It's not just some bidding strategy, although there's uh, some of that in there. But um, tactical empathy is what he calls it. Yeah. Now, now I gotta. Can't remember if I downloaded it or not, but um, I I feel like on the past three episodes I tell people I'm in the middle of Fortitude by Dan Crenshaw again. Okay. Again. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm kind of at a point I I'm like you I have to have content. Uh, it has to be on two times the speed, three if the app will allow it. Mm -hmm. Um, and just play play next play. Uh, but. I want to get to a point where the audiobooks, like 
I'm able to reference them uh, very thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm not not comfortable being able to do that with a lot of them. And so um, here's what I'd recommend doing is, is uh, you, you might have heard the thing. It's like when you hear it, you remember like 10 percent of it. Mm -hmm. When you hear it and write it down, you'll remember more. When you hear it, write it down and then talk about it, you know, teach it. Yeah. A lot of a lot of salespeople, a lot of the trainings will tell you teach it. When you learn something, go teach it because mm. now it drives it into your system to where, uh, like I've done podcasts before, and something will come out of me, and I'm like, wow, that was good. Like, where the hell did that come from? You know, like I know that wasn't my original thought; it just rolled out. Yeah. Um, having or you're having a conversation with someone trying to help someone market their business or something, but uh, taking notes. Um, you know, if I showed you my notepad, I've got. Uh, all kinds of quotes and stuff like that 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 really jump out to me and and uh, sometimes when you need to recharge, let's say you dealt with a tough customer or you get an employee busting your chops or you got something going wrong, sit down and go through your little motivational list. You know, it might be something Conor McGregor said, it might be something Anthony Robbins said, and just kind of get charged up. Listen to a little Gary V. Uh, but taking taking some notes uh, will definitely help you remember stuff. Yeah. that's that's one of the things that definitely helps me anyway i need to uh so i i got a rocket book a little while ago and uh the nug as we shall call him <laughs> uh shoot up the pen that goes with it. so uh, rocket geez. book you can take notes okay. and like it uploads or you scan it into your google drive or whatever okay. and then there's just this like microphone towel and you just hmm. wipe it so it's like a never-ending notebook that that's pretty cool yeah. which i, I like because i have notebooks and you know then you run out of paper and you gotta right. get another one or whatever so i'm a huge tech guy mm -hmm. and i'll store all my notes on my phone but i need to do what you're saying with my rocket book just get another pen and you know or maybe uh stay consistent with it you know the thing is if it goes on the calendar you'll typically do it so so maybe it's something you put on your calendar for every friday at three o'clock you're going to review stuff yeah. or um, something along those lines. That's something that, that I've had to work on over the years is that if I schedule it, it gets done, mm. you know, and it might be, I got to call such and such. I got to put it in my calendar. Yeah. You know, that'll help me to remember to do it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have a rolling checklist in addition uh, just because there's some things that <laughs> The way my brain works, uh, I think it's going to take me five minutes, and then two hours later, I'm like, oh, why did it? I just right. sometimes I suck at figuring out how long something takes, mm -hmm. and then if it's a personal thing too, and it doesn't necessarily involve anyone else, whether it's work or you know at home. Uh, so I use uh, Google Keep in addition to my calendar, okay, and I'll put stuff on that list. So uh, I think if I want to start like once a week maybe i'll use the calendar but mm -hmm. eventually incorporate it into that rolling checklist okay. i feel really good when i click the check mark that's, there you go yeah absolutely the, uh, that's an accomplishment. uh admiral uh, william uh i can't remember his last name uh always make your bed yeah that guy yeah yeah i uh, figured you're talking about him yeah yeah <laughs> It's a great speech. That's that's why I like a checklist so I yeah. can check it off and I get that sense of yeah. accomplishment. Definitely. Uh, so so now uh, I'd love to to ask you the the four questions we've had brewing. Awesome. Um, and it it sounds like we may have covered some of it, but when you're not, uh, you know, running your company and developing your guys, uh, what do you like to do for fun? I love poker. Um, I'm a I really really enjoy poker. I love the competition at it. And uh, I never would have guessed how much business would come from poker. Mm. Uh, poker's like any organization that you're a part of or people that you're around regularly. Uh, it's just great networking. They get to know you. Um, but I, I love the competition of it. Uh, winning a World Series of Poker ring is on my, my bucket list to win one of those. Uh, so I definitely enjoy cash game and tournament poker. Okay. Yeah, definitely fun. They did a lot of that downrange. I, I, I can spell it. That's about it. Okay. I, just, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed the atmosphere. Yeah. And uh, I'll hang around, but 
then somebody asked me if I want in, and I'm like, I don't really know what that means. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, we referenced it, but the Ray Dalio book or any other books that you want to yeah, Ray, talk I, about. I just downloaded this today. So it's uh, The Changing World Hoarder, and I'm on track four right now. Um, I'm a big Ray Dalio fan. His, yeah. his first book, Principles, was really, really good. That's definitely one of those books to, to go through multiple times, take notes. Um one of the one of the number one things out of that book that that I love about Ray Dalio is he wants to stress test his perspective always. So if if I think it's a bad idea to take a vaccine, for example, or the coronavirus vaccine, well, I'm going to stress test it. I'm going to go have conversations with people that really think I should take it, hmm. and I want their perspective because I hey, you're a smart guy. You think I should do A, B, and C. Why do you feel that way? Well, what do you think about the bears, you know, adverse reporting? Or what do you think about that? Like you're discounting those or so. So it helps me refine my perspective. Um, but but I'm really excited about this book because it's the uh, the changing world order. And it talks about how um, he has studied for financial certain Ray Dalio. You mean, I know he's a self-made billionaire. Um, and uh, but he's one of the, the smartest investors on the planet, running hedge funds and things like that. And he's really interested in history. So you know when the when the uh, economy has done this, the government's got low interest money out there. They're printing off money, this and that. Like, what can I expect? Has this happened before in history? Mm. You know. And one of the things he's talking about in this book, there's a lot of similarities in the '30s. Um, that are happening now. Mm. And it's, you know, decisions the Fed are making. There's all kinds of social tension right now. Um, there's all these trends that have caused the the have the haves and the have nots gaps have, have has grown a little bit. What's causing that? So what happens in a society when these things are happening? Because he's trying to figure out how to be positioned financially. Yeah. You know, he's got, I don't even think he takes investors anymore, but he's got like, you know. 250 billion that he manages or some ridiculous amount of money. Um, but uh, so I'm really interested in this book to see, because I think we're in a really unique situation and I love my country, you know, I think we're in a really unique situation right now uh, because there's a lot of people in this country that don't have the same values that I do. You know, they hate this country, but they want people to come here. No, it's, you know, I, I just love to have conversations with you. If yeah. it's so bad, why do you want people to come here? And why is everybody coming here? You know, half of the world's immigration comes to this country. Half. So it can't be that bad. Yeah. So why don't you stop knocking it? Matter of fact, you won't leave, will you? If I got enough money to get you to leave this country, you still wouldn't leave. Um, so there's just a lot of values that that are I just think are, are creating a lot of conflict. And... Uh, you know he's he's talking about that in in the book so far, and it's it's uh you know there's there's cultural values that are creating tension. There's there's the haves and the have-nots that are creating tension, and and uh, you know how do you fix that? How do you contribute to to be a better person in that? And how do you invest so you're not caught off guard? Yeah, I I uh, I'll reference um. Robert Kiyosaki, the cash flow quadrant, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, and Rich yeah. Dad, Poor Dad reminded me of it. And then uh, one that I finally downloaded on audiobook, my buddy Tim lent me uh, kind of like a permanent loan type deal, hard copy. And I, unfortunately, am not a hard copy mm -hmm. guy. I have two bookshelves at home overflowing. and uh, They look good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it's all the way down to like I have some kids' books that when I have kids, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have those. You know, um, zombie survival guide, how to be a ninja. You know, all the way up to uh, ten thousand things to be happy about. So, mm -hmm. um, Robert Kiyosaki's the cash flow quadrant because I used to sell books. Okay. Um, so uh, that one I had two copies of that. Um, I've got Trump's. Uh, so, so I don't think it's art of the deal. Art I think deal. it's uh, how to become a billionaire. No, the second one, the um, art of the comeback. Okay. Um, and then uh, all all sorts of ones, but Robert Kiyosaki's uh, cash flow quadrant, and then 
my buddy lent me a hard copy of John Acuff's Finish, mm -hmm. which when I picked it up, I was unaware he also wrote the book Start. Uh, so Start would be for the folks you talked about at the beginning who have to have everything perfect, planned, don't want to do anything just yet. You know, I'm making right. sure all my ducks in a row and Finish is for people who don't complete anything. Uh, really great. One thing uh, I really took away from that book was, um, you know, we we all know about smart goals and readjusting them if, if we need to. Uh, however, he talks about, you know, if you set a goal uh, to do, um, say, I don't know, 100 or something, mm -hmm. and, and your timeline is, you know, maybe a, you have a month, whatever this thing is, uh, and you get to day 20. And you have 40 days, then you revise your goal to half that. Mm -hmm. So um, you cut your in cutting your goals in half, which is what he calls it. Uh, you still accomplish your goal. You still get that sense of accomplishment. You finish something, but now it's not so outlandish because maybe you thought you were capable of doing that 100, but uh, you still get to the 50. Okay. Uh, John Acuff's finish in uh, the cash flow quadrant. That's where I learned about what you talked about with uh, self-employed versus business owner, mm -hmm. kind of the the difference between the mentality. Those. Yeah. Well, I thought I thought that was really interesting because, you know, I guess before we are business owners um, and kind of get that life experience, like like you mentioned, uh, you're kind of like, oh, self-employed business owner, same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then I read that book and I was like, nope, got it. Yeah. yeah. It's a version of it for sure. Yeah. You know, and it's even a small company like mine. I mean, our, our expenses are, you know, 65, 70 grand a month. That's a lot of pressure. And and I, I personally don't have any debt. It's it's all the company, right? It's, it's uh, uh, but it's a lot. And you have a bad month or two. I mean, you start feeling it quickly. And so that's where, you know, the, uh, there's just a different level of stress. It's, it's when you're self-employed, it's like you're, you, you're worried about your money. Yeah, but then you've got all this other liability. You got people on salary. You got you know vehicles. You got all that stuff that uh, it's just a it's it's just growing to growing to that point really. I think. Yeah. Well. Uh. So. Uh. Next question is um if if you could have a beer uh or or bourbon with anyone dead or alive who would it be and why. Mm. Uh, Frank Sinatra came to mind first. I don't know why. Uh, I just think he lived, like I always, I always said, like, I, I don't know that I'd change my life with a lot of other people because I'm pretty happy. But like Frank Sinatra had an amazing life, right? Mm. Uh, Tom Brady probably is up there. Um, you know, someone like Abraham Lincoln would be pretty interesting talking to. Um, have a beer with anybody and why. Let's just go with, uh, it'd be Tom Brady right now. I just love to pick his brain about a lot of stuff. Uh, I guess because he's in the same generation we are. Um, the guy's just, all he does is win, man. All he does is say the right thing. He seems to be a great dad. He seems to be a great husband. Good looking guy. Married a woman, makes more money than he does. <laughs> like, man, the guy just does everything right. And uh, he's getting better in his 40s when everybody's declined well before that. So mm -hmm. the guy's got some stuff figured out. I'd love to pick his brain. So it'd be, it'd be Tom Brady. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have, have you read his book, The TD12 Method? I have not. I, I recommend it. Okay. Um, I feel like the end of it is a little bit of a how-to slash sales pitch. Okay. Uh, which is kind of a swing and a miss for us because we're not uh, trying to play NFL. Yeah. Uh, or at least I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> Athletically. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, the the beginning and the, the, the bulk of the book is... Uh, that's okay. excellent. It talks about that stuff. Uh, I actually haven't listened to that one in a while, so I might have to okay. go back now. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to check that out. I'm a, you know, I'm a big Tom Brady fan, you right. know, if you will. And uh, Tom versus Time on Facebook was a great five part uh, series of videos on Facebook. That was really good. I've I've re listened to that probably three times each. And in there, you get to see how Giselle is really. You know, I think they make each other better. I mm -hmm. think that, uh, you know, I'm single, but, you know, if I'm if I'm going to end up with someone, it's going to be that kind of a scenario to where you both make each other better. 
Um, but she's she's on top of her game too, mentally. You can tell from the conversations and stuff. But just seeing the seeing the adversity, um, seeing Tom talking about how you know dealing with the haters because obviously you're you're doing podcast, you're putting yourself out there, so you're gonna you're gonna start hearing little chirps. Uh, I've heard I'm an alcoholic. I've heard a bunch of nonsense about me as well. And it's like, and I'm just some little turd in Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> you know? But Tom Brady, I mean, think about this. Everybody has an opinion about Tom Brady. Yeah. Everybody. I, I I don't even watch football. Like, I can't. Right. I I can't. I can barely spell it. Okay. Uh, I just, growing up, uh, my, I think at this point, my dad claims that he wasn't a sports fan, but I feel like if it was football or NASCAR, the TV was on, and me and my brother, we just never caught it. Yeah. I played baseball for nine years, but once I got into the Army, um, I will tell you, I will I, I will get into that Super Bowl party. The, the wings don't have a chance. <laughs> but other than that, like, I don't even think I knew who Tom Brady was until I met my fiance. Okay. Because she is... Well, if you ask her, the only Tom Brady fan. But uh, I was leaving work, yeah. full commission sales, closing late, you know, make it happen anyways, working with a buddy. He was like, thanks for hanging out with me and, you know, making sure I got the job done. I was like, as much as I love you, bro, uh, I don't want to go to this uh, Super Bowl party. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was, I can't remember the year, but the the Patriots were down. I said, I don't, I don't want to go because <laughs> she's going to be mad or upset or whatever. <laughs> and I show up in the time I left my territory to when I got to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. They were not only pulling ahead to win, but she was also standing in front of like a 60 inch flat screen TV screaming at it. at it. And that's just something I don't get. So a uh, huge Tom Brady fan, but more for Tom Brady. Don't. Don't know much about his football or anybody yeah. else's football. Yeah. But, um, All right. You said time versus Tom? Uh, uh, Tom versus time. Okay. And it's a, just a great series, but you get to see a lot of the behind the scenes. It's basically over the course of a season. Mm. They chopped it up into five things, and you just get to see his mindset, how he's interacting with people. Like a great thing, he's in Montana off season with uh, it was Julian Edelman. It was a, uh, Amendola, and uh, they had a couple wide receivers. He's out there with his quarterback's coach and this and that. But they're out practicing in the offseason in Montana. But they also made, they did fun stuff. You know, they're out there riding dune buggies and stuff. But, you know, watching Tom Brady ride these guys, you know, Edelman's running for the seventh time on a route, and they're, they're just getting this route perfected. And Tom's like, and you're fucking cheating me Jules you're cheating me you know like come out of that break you need to run hard and Julian's bitch well you're you're not out running Tom's like it's not my fucking job to run like do your job and but they're they're going at it you know they're just but that's where the iron sharpens iron they're they're, they love each other they respect each other but man they're breaking each other's balls because they're trying to get it right yeah and that shows up on the field you know so it's it's you know he goes to Tampa Bay you know, that impact, his mindset impacted the entire team. And obviously they won the Super Bowl. Um, and he had talent around him and all this kind of stuff, but just the mentality of going in there that we're going to be the best, we're going to drill. And uh, the guy's just, the guy just every, all he does is win, you know, and yeah. uh, you can hate him for it all you want. But uh, it's, uh, it's his mindset for a lot of it. Yeah. You know, but that's the time versus time. You get to get to see a lot of it. You get to see some of the humility and, and the stuff he deals with on the back end. But uh, really good, really good content. Inspirational for sure. I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, especially if uh, if uh, if your girl hadn't seen that, she'll love it too. Because you get to see, you know, Giselle talking to him after a loss and things like that, and like it's just you know building each other up. And I'll I'll ask her, but if you know if she can't chuck an iPhone or you know, scream at a television. <laughs> I don't know if she's into it or not. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, so last and probably the most important question, whether someone uh, needs security for their home or business okay. or somebody wants to start their own uh, business or mm-hmm. maybe security business, where can people find you? Well, I watch security Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I watch security.com. 
Uh, we're headquartered here in Raleigh. We, we cover from pretty much the coast to about Charlotte right now. Um, if you want to start a security company, I actually don't recommend it. And I, I <laughs> truly, truly mean that with every ounce of my body. It's an incredibly tough, low margin business. Um, I joke around, but, but I'm not joking. Like I would be a multimillionaire already had I gone into roofing or something where you go out and you do the job, you do it right, and you make money. Hmm. So the security industry, the business model that's out there is you, you go out there and you take care of the client and you got to invest a lot of money in a lot of cases to be competitive, you know, zero down 45 bucks a month, 99 down or something. Well, as a security company, we're investing like a thousand dollars in that account. Yeah. Like I got commissions, I got technician, I got equipment. I mean, basically putting an iPad in your house and then all the sensors and drills and trucks and, you know, it's a, uh, it's not a great industry to get into. It's just I, not. I see what you're saying. It's yeah. like you've got all this up front. You've got to cover right before you're, you know, you before you start word investment long term. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're starting, if you got ten million dollars laying around and you want to wrap it up in security accounts, get into it. Yeah, you know. But at the end of the day, it's it's a uh, it's just not a great industry to be a small company. No. Um, that's why you see a lot of small companies come and go. You got these big companies that have all this money, uh, the, the Spectrums, the Time Warners, the you know CPI, ADT, Brinks, all these massive companies um, that you're competing against. And you know we have to be competitive and we have to offer similar type things uh, to, to try to meet customers' needs. Then you got do-it-yourself security, trying to get everybody thinking they can install this stuff themselves and pushing out garbage you know yeah. quite honestly just easily defeated stuff that you know anybody that sits down with us and compares apples to apples are like oh i didn't realize all that and it's like well yeah you know and then we're like this much more expensive yeah. you know to have professionals dealing with it and better equipment and um so unless you're a glutton for punishment don't get in the security <laughs> business and I, I mean that with every every ounce of my body yeah uh it's uh had I been doing many other things, I'd be much, I'd be wealthy at this point. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. Uh, and I don't say that to sound cocky, um, but it's just, it's factual. I mean, we're, we're one of the highest rated security companies in the state out of 800 plus licensed companies. Mm. And a lot of our competitors are billion dollar companies. Yeah. And it's like, we're, we're kicking their butt left and right, but you know, we got to get our name in the hat. And uh, even our Google ads and different things that we do, it's just, they're so much more expensive than they should be mm. because of all the competition driving those things up. And those big companies, they can just drown you with advertising. Yeah. You know, whereas we got to get out there and hand to hand combat and we got to, you know, we're out there. Uh, for example, had I gone into roofing, you go out and you do a $12,000 roof and you make four grand. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do many roofs. You do one a week, you're you're killing it, right? Yeah. You got a great life. You know, that's I call those, you know, grand slams or you know, doubles and things like that. I'm out here getting hit by pitches. Yeah. To try to drive in a run. <laughs> I'm taking one in the leg to try to score. You know, yeah. that's the security industry. Um, it's it's you know, sacrifice flies that you're bunting, you know, to move the runner over. It's uh, there's no grand slams with what we do. Yeah. You know, there's home run once in a while. We go out and do a twenty-five thousand dollar camera job or something. That's a home run for us. You know, we make some margin. But uh, the reoccurring revenue model, it's uh, it's great on paper, and uh, we're doing it. We do it well. Uh, but it's just mentally mentally resilient, and uh, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Got to call you up. I'm thinking about getting into security. No. <laughs> I, I, I can give you three things that I would jump into right away. Uh, you know, podcasting. We were just talking about this. Um, someone who can make and edit video. Every business owner should be putting out content, uh, putting out, creating commercials, things like that. Um, that's a good business to get into uh, because you can, you know, you can make 50 bucks an hour all day long. You, you can work for two to four weeks to kind of drill in what you're doing few thousand bucks in equipment to really learn what you're doing. And now you just go out and sell yourself to business owners, yeah. uh, realtors that need, you know, this or that, you want videos of this 
uh, this and that. Someone like me is perfectly willing to pay you to, to create video content. Um, that's a great need that I see, but contractors are getting paid right now. Bad contractors are making tons of money right now. You, you can't plumbers, um, electricians, roofers, you know, uh, hard, hardwood flooring, drywall. If you're in contracting, you're just, you're, people are not even answering, returning your calls when you call them because they're just so busy. Yeah. And they're making great margin. Yeah. <laughs> you know, didn't have to go to college. You just had to get out there and, and hustle and, and learn the trade I'm and up. then just be accountable. I'm, I'm working on, uh, working on a book. I have a deadline, so. I need, okay. to, need to get finish it up. All right. Everything I know about business, I learned from a high school dropout. My brother never finished school. Runs a multi-million dollar plumbing company. Nice. In North Carolina, so he's probably accountable and he probably does what he says he's going to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think if you held a conversation with him, which I, I've actually at this point I've had him on the show twice because uh, we did a very similar thing with him, and then he wanted to put one out. Uh, so it was him, an electrician, and an insurance guy. And that was a really, really cool episode. Um, so uh, I had him on both those times. But yeah, um, you know, no traditional business school, no mm -hmm. no formal training or anything like that. Just uh, a, a lot of a lot of willpower and, and motivation. And, yeah. and the rest was probably just perseverance. Yeah, you know, accountability. Not, not giving up. Yeah. <laughs> You tell someone you're going to do it, you know, uh, the client, you say you're going to do A, B, C, do A, B, and C. And it's it's amazing. 20% of my life with business is just chasing down people to do what they're supposed to be doing. 20% of what I do. And it's uh, manufacturers, suppliers, you know, uh, employees, although I've got great, I've got a great team right now. I'm very blessed for that. Um, just, I mean, credit card processing companies, you know, just. You name yeah. it, it's, you're just always chasing someone down. Uh, there was a big payroll uh, mistake that we had recently, which it was a random debit on my account, trying to unwind all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. you know, but anyway, yeah. enough about that. But I, I definitely appreciate you having me on here, Ryan. Yeah. It was fun. Thank, thanks for coming yeah. on. Uh, so, so you guys, um, there's probably... This will probably be the, the longest show notes ever. Uh, <laughs> Brian and I talk about every single book that exists. Um, and I want to always make it easy for you. So in the show notes, a uh, link to his website, um, anything else um, as far as contact information or content he wants me to put down there, I'm going to include. So check the show notes, uh, links to every single book. And you already know about the coffee and the website. So be sure to check those out as well. And if things go as planned tomorrow, uh, then uh, next week's episode will be a comedian. So. Be sure to check that one out. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right, brother. This has been the Business and Brew Show, hosted by yours truly, Ryan Smeltz. Edited and produced by Ryan 